All right, so picking up again here, talk about uh, chapter three of TAP. It's an awesome little book, Matrix Groups for Undergraduates, if I hadn't mentioned it already. Now, um, so I'll talk about inner products, quote unquote. So um, here's how that goes. So a lot of it's based on the notion of a conjugation. Um, of course, for the reals, um, well, it's real, so sorry about this. This is, uh, I think my, I, I left my notes out where my, my two-year-old could get to them, and well, if they have a marker and time, well, they'll do things. Anyway, so conjugation's kind of boring for the reals. Um, so, you know, absolute values, sum of Q squared, but of course that's really Q Q bar if you look at it the right way. Complex, uh, the uh, conjugation starts to get interesting. Right, so the the, the uh, length of a complex number, the norm is a squared plus p squared. Of course, that's the square root of q q bar. For a quaternion, you basically just keep doing minuses on everything, like that. And it, it is in fact true that if you take q, the product of q and q bar, that pops out, which is starting to be surprising. Um, so generally, there you have this identity. Uh, the product of the conjugate is the, um, well, excuse me, the conjugate of the product is the product of the conjugates in opposite order, and that is um, necessary that you switch the order around uh, for the quaternions. And, um, well, anyway, similar fun things happen for supernumbers, but whatever. Uh, so z, z bar is z bar z, z squared, and um, so this shows you that the the norm, um, the length of the product, is the product of the lengths um, for the norm so defined. Now this is this is a very special, wonderful thing again that happens because we have a division algebra, a normed division algebra to be more precise. You can't do this for other algebras, all right? In other algebras, you'll find that the if you set up a norm on it, um, uh, well, either it's not a norm and it's multiplicative. Or if it is a norm, it's got to be submultiplicative. You have an inequality here, and the inequality is is in fact um, governed by the structure constants. But anyway, that is not tap. That's just some of my studies the last couple of years. Anyway, so the standard inner product um, from Kn to Kn is uh, you know here's how you define it in terms of the product, the sum of the products of the components and the conjugate components. Um, like so, this is the standard norm on Kn, and the excuse me, the standard inner product on Kn is this, and the standard norm is induced from the standard inner product in the standard way. <laughs> okay, well, this is also very standard. All right, um, <clears throat> great. So you might object to the terminology inner product since it's k-valued, but that probably just comes from you being like me when I wrote these notes and not being very experienced. Um, of course, inner products don't have to be real valued. And we work on the complex factor space. You talk about complex valued inner product. That's standard stuff. And this just extends that notion to quaternions. All right. So the inner product is biadditive, as you'd expect. And it's like half. So sometimes it's called sesquilinear because you can pull the constant out on the first entry without, you know, grumbling. And on the second entry, it pulls out on the, on the right. Um, as the uh, the conjugate, so it's sometimes it's called sesquilinear because it's like it's um, it's a like half linear, but it's maybe it should be called 1.5 times linear because at least it's additive and it's it's half it's got half the homogeneity you want. But anyway, name calling aside, there it is. So that brings us to our definition of what does it mean for a um, you know pair of vectors to be orthonormal in k tuples of k numbers. Excuse me, n tuples of k numbers. What am I saying? So if the standard inner product is zero, they are orthonormal. Uh, well, excuse me, orthonormal. I do believe I need to correct that. I mean, come on, folks, what is going on here? Orthogonal. We have not assumed any kind of normality condition on this just yet. For example, zero would be orthogonal to everything, as is usually the case. And then we could talk about a basis being orthonormal. So if I, to say orthonormal, I would have to have this condition plus the condition that each one of these vectors have length one, right? 
So a more productive thing would have been not to cross that out and just add the uh, norm of x and x and the norm of y and y. I mean, it's be the inner product of x with itself and the inner product of y with itself. They're both equal to 1. Anyway, you guys know what's going on here, so I'm going to move along here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you talk about an orthonormal basis, as is usually characterized by this um, one of my favorite equations that the inner product is equal to the Kronecker delta. Um, standard basis, you know, here <laughs> the, the formula, the uh, the components of the standard basis, also given by the Kronecker delta, it's everywhere, um, is is an example of an orthonormal basis in in the k, the n tuples of num of uh, k numbers. So here's some some fun trivia for you. Of course, we know and love this formula. The inner product over the reals is it, it reveals the cosine of the angle between the vectors, if they're non-zero. If one of the vectors is zero, it doesn't tell you anything about the angle. Well, what is the angle of the zero vector? I don't know. Is it nothing? Is it everything? Apparently my children are jumping off their beds upstairs. Well, all right, anyway, moving on. <laughs> For x and y and cn, the inner product is actually given by the real it has it has geometric content. Here's how it goes. Um, you use, I often see this exercise in like the one-dimensional case, um, you know, for a complex analysis course. But uh, so the inner product of x and y. So you basically take this and it's corresponding two n vector. It's corresponding two n vector. So it gives the inner product between the corresponding images of the two n vectors plus i times the inner product between the um, 2n vector fx and this 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 rotated one, um, where that's natural. I mean, so there's there's what it is, but you know what does that mean? Hmm. So of course, one thing you can get from that that's kind of fun is if if you have the in complex inner product to zero, you have both the inner product of the um, image and the image with the rotated image under the the real imaginary isomorphism to R2n being being zero. So you have the orthogonality of of these as well. Interesting. All right. <clears throat> Doubtless that is useful for problems where you get into the nitty gritty of things. So, um, in particular, here's one. Uh, if, if this is the orthonormal basis for CN, that's true if and only if the corresponding strung out basis here, F, IV, F of IV1, da da da, F. IVN is an orthonormal basis for R2N, and the, the proof of that proposition is, is probably heavily, well, not probably, it, it's going to be based on what we just looked at in the red. Right. So, and you can also find an analog for the quaternions, which is on page 35 to 36, which is neat, but not so neat that I'm going to show you the details. So, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's too neat for me to show you the details. Let's see here. So, we have the big picture now. The orthogonal matrices over k, n by n orthogonal matrices over k. We have a unified notation. Orthogonal n by n matrices over r. Orthogonal n by n matrices over c. Orthogonal n by n matrices over h. These are respectively, when you view them as, um, you know, in terms of their image and other things, the so-called on, or the orthogonal matrices, just plain old orthogonal matrices over R, the unitary matrices, or the symplectic matrices. All right, now we'll get into more details here as we go on. So in particular, I'll be more, more precise here. Um, this will reveal the definition, because I, I haven't really defined anything just yet. I just, uh, I, I, I mean, I just threw some notation at you. Um, we'll, we'll explain how they're defined here eventually. So, rho n of u n, in other words, the real, so apparently u n is what? It's complex. So the, um, just to be, to be clear here, these are, this is n by n real matrices, this is a particular kind of n by n complex matrix, this is a particular kind of n by n quaternionic matrix, very natural, all right? And so it's interesting to ask, well, what, what are their corresponding, you know, matrices look like in either the reals? So like, for example, the image of the unitary matrices is the intersection of the 2n by 2n uh, real orthogonal matrices 
and the invertible um, n by n complex. So it's, it's the intersection of the real orthogonal and the complex linear matrices gives you the unitary matrices in the, um, the, the 2n by 2n real matrices. The cyan of SPN, the connection, so the, the, the image of the, orth, the, the symplectic matrices in the complex 2n by 2n matrices is that it's, it's basically it's the 2n by 2n unitary matrices which are also quaternionic linear, right? And, and if you want to be like, well, what about, let's get real. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, the, the, uh, so the image of the symplectic matrices in the 4n by 4n real matrices is they're orthogonal in the real sense, and they're also um, quaternionic linear, all right? Very natural, very, very natural. So, you know, what, why are these interesting? Well, in particular, un is isomorphic to the rigid motions in R2n, which preserves J2n. That's the way we can look at number number two there, or at number, number one, actually. <clears throat> I, I still don't think I've actually defined I don't think I actually defined here. Maybe I, I think I did when I did it in class, but at some point I gave some lectures on these to some un, unknowing students. Right, I'm going to put it back on page eight here. If you don't mind me going back in time a little bit. Do 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 do. do. All right, where are we? Sorry, I'll get my act together here eventually. So, what is the definition of orthogonal? Definition, um, you know, we say R, let's say RA is a mapping from KN to KN, and um, A, all right, is an element of ONK if what? Um, if and only if R A X R A Y is equal to X Y for all X and Y and K N. So in other words, it preserves the standard inner product. They're isometries of the standard inner product um, over K. That's what would be the definition. Okay, that's the definition which I left out in my previous jibber jabbering. So, getting back to work here, now that I fixed that, sorry. Of course, you should really get Tap's book if you want to do this seriously because well, a quick read through his book will really make this make more sense. All right, so proposition ONK. There, another way to look at it is, is actually just the um, matrices in the invertible n by n matrices over the over k, which preserve the the norm of the image. All right, the proof is given on page thirty-eight. I would wager it's well. I mean, not wager. You can look at it. All right. Now, although I'm tempted to go through that proof, um, let me move on here. Special orthogonal groups. Um, so, it's here's the, the the definition is basically you just say determinant is one, um, and you you see you have um, a and on or a in um, un, and the determinant being one that makes it special orthogonal matrix or special unitary matrix, or if you just have in the invertible matrices over K, you just say um, the special linear group is, is this guy. So anyway, typically adding adding an S to the um, you know to the matrix group imposes the determinant one condition on it. That's a common notation. So here's the proposition: if A is an O and K, then the the, um, the the length of the determinant's one. So that either in, in the real case and in the quaternionic case, because of how the, de the determinants defined, that means that the, um, the determinants plus or minus one, those are the real things that have real numbers that have length one or plus or minus one, right? But in the uni unitary case, the determinant could be something on the unit circle in the complexes, so it's a little bit more exciting, the unitary groups 
the unitary matrices have determinant, which are um, somewhere on the, on the unit circle in the complexes. All right, so that's just a little bit on orthogonal matrix groups. These turn out to be the building blocks for much of what's done in the rest of this book, which is interesting. The next thing we're going to talk about, I think I skip over the topology chapter for now, and I go straight ahead to the Lie algebra chapter. And so there we'll have a very quick tour of Lie algebra. Anyway, I'm going to start again in a minute. Thanks.